Thank you very much, David. And good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to our event here. Hope it's been worthwhile. This is I was assigned the evolution of spinal surgery. How has surgery improved, or has it improved the life of the patient undergoing scoliosis surgery? And let's look at evolution is a, is a process of continuous change from a lower, simpler, or worse situation to a higher, more complex, or a better state. And I think we have to look at the evolution of spinal surgery in two ways. One is the intellectual evolution of the thought process that has gone into uh, the various stages in spinal surgery. And to, to be able to achieve that, you have to have technical uh, evolution also. So it's a, it's a combination of uh, brain power and making, making tools. In uh, segmental spinal instrumentation was the topic, and this is one in which almost every vertebra receives some type of anchor, and then today that's usually a screw. This is my history of what I've done over my career, starting out in the 70s with Harrington and then progressing to Eduardo Lucchi's uh, system in the 80s, uh, John Dubasset and East Cottrell's revolutionary system. 1993, we began with our Moss Miami device. And for the last 20 years, I've been basically stuck on all pedicle screws, which isn't a bad thing. But mentors over my career, I've had a lot of them. Tom Whitesides, during my time at Emory University, was a real motivation for me. I joined Robert Kaiser in practice in Miami, who was a SRS founding member and my mentor for uh, many years. Uh, Eduardo Lucchi has been very kind to me years ago in teaching me his thought processes and how to do his device. Jean Dubasset is one of my best friends and has been for 30 years. And as you'll see, he and Yves Cottrell changed scoliosis surgery. Uh, Professor Harms of Germany has been a big influence on me, as has Professor Sook. And my current uh, mentor or collaborator is Peter Newton, from whom I've learned a lot. So let, let's go back in time. In 58, Paul Harrington really revolutionized spinal surgery, and this was a sentinel event. Uh, he devised a ride that initially he didn't do it with, with fusion. Subsequently, he and John Moe added fusion, and this required a cast and uh, bed rest for months in the initial uh, Harrington era. And this is just pictures of the distraction or spreading out in the short side and compression or uh, shortening on the long side uh, in the various stages. And Harrington from, was, was good from the 60s to the 80s. It was revolutionary, got a high fusion rate, it eliminated bed rest, and everybody was in some type of wrist or cast. I'm not sure why she's smiling. <laughs> but, did it make life better? Sure it did. It got uh, the ability to correct scoliosis and got people got them out of bed post-op. A sentinel event for sure. But Harrington was not, it was detrimental to the profile and you've heard, heard about the curves that should be present looking sideways and uh, while the Harrington device straightened the frontal curves, it really destroyed these. So this is uh, the result of a Harrington fusion 20 years ago in an adult. Now she's got the what's termed Harrington flatback syndrome, forward in space, and uh, needs significant reconstructive procedures. Eduardo Lucchi uh, came along in the 70, 70s. He was from Mexico City. He trained at, uh, at Stanford with Edward Risser and actually married his daughter. He went back to Mexico City and began his sublaminar wire technique. Uh, and this was really the first segmental fixation. Uh, Lukey added a lot. He added uh, little or no immobilization. There was the ability to sagittal contour, as you see on the right. And this, for me, was a, bi a big learning experience about what people should look like. It allowed contouring. It was. Uh, usable in any level of the spine and uh, less to no immobilization. So did this make life better? Uh, it was primarily used in, in the paralytic patients, but we had a large experience in the idiopathic patient and uh, there was 
little or no immobilization. And uh, yes, it did make life better also. So we we're making advances. Going into the 80s, Jean Dubasset uh, is the intellectual uh, evolution and his 3D description of AIS, which is still valid today. Uh, I don't think ch things have changed much how John saw it 30 years ago, although we're able to image it better and uh, can show it to you uh, as patients better. Uh, John teamed up with Yves Cottrell, uh, who had developed his rod system. Uh, it was hooks initially and then screws and neural rod and a transverse connector seen here. And that was the Cottrell Dubasset or CD instrumentation system, which was first shown in 84 and uh, uh, truly changed spinal surgery forever. And we had an initial course on CD instrumentation in Miami in 1985. And that's Eve, Cynthia Clark, John Dubasset, and myself after our course here. Uh, what did it do? Well, it was no cast and no brace after surgery. Tremendous advance for the patient. It allowed profile contouring, segmental fixation, and this really was uh, took the world by storm. It was all over. And uh, did it make life better? Absolutely, it did. And uh, I said, Cottrell, CD change forever spinal surgery by allowing some degree of 3D correction. Uh, but it also uh, was conceptually difficult with a, to learn, and there's somewhat of a steep learning curve. And uh, there were whole courses built around planning for Cottrell Dubasset instrumentation. And this was a truly intellectual process of Jean Dubasset and the technological contribution of Yves Cottrell. Truly a sentinel event. So after, after 92, I became more less involved with conventional hook-based systems and moved to uh, screw-based systems. In 1985, we designed the first polyaxial screw, which changed spine surgery a lot. 95 to 98, I became using more and more screws, going from the lumbar spine, where it's pretty easy, to the thoracic spine, where I initially thought people were crazy putting in there. And by the end of the 90s, I was only using pedicle screws. Professor Sook uh, is the one who, from Seoul, Korea, described thoracic screws for deformity. And this was uh, really pretty early on. 1995, his paper was published. And this was a sentinel event. It got everybody's attention and really turned <laughs> the world towards this, the pedicle screw fixation and the superiority of that. Well, let's go back to, to 1966 and Paul Harrington again. And he, desi he defi designed a pedicle screw at that time for a condition called spondylolisthesis and actually got it patented and got it FDA approved. And this is the whole reason we're able to use pedicle screws uh, in deformity today because of what happened 50 years ago. Pretty smart guy. Sook's uh, Sentinel event, the, the article on using thoracic pedicle screws in adolescent deformity, showing improvement in everything over hooks. There was really minimal loss of correction and basically no loss of, of no implant failures. Insertion techniques, uh, again, was a paradigm shift in learning and required uh, practicing cadaver labs, uh, visiting people who were expert in it, like Sook, like Harms, and like Larry Lenke, who was in St. Louis and now New York. And I think these were the pioneers who taught people how to use pedicle screws. So between, from the early 2000s to now, pedicle screws have become the default standard of care. It really is segmental. You can get three-dimensional correction. It probably allows shorter fusions, which is patient benefit, as you've heard many times. And it allows a very rapid return to activity. So did pedicle screws make life better? Sure it did. Uh, so we've seen life made better for the patient 
in, in several decades. What's the future hold? Well, those, certainly the evolution of the 3D understanding will happen. Uh, and this is just in the surgery area era. There should be implant improvements, including smaller implants, stronger implants, maybe a different method of vertebral attachment, maybe not pedicle screws anymore. And I guess I'm the only one to say this word, tether evolution. Uh, the 3D evaluation, uh, you've heard about the EOS, and uh, this should only get better, allowing more rapid production of, of 3D images. So is life better in all these area, areas for uh, you, the patients? Uh, I think, it, and I've had the... Uh, I'm fortunate enough to visualize things over uh, probably five decades, and abs absolutely life is better for every, in every uh, evolution. The future who, who will rely upon research and development, research such as produced by the HARM study group. Uh, this will allow us to get intellectual innovation, and from that we should be able to uh, convince industry to provide the technical innovation to uh, it result in improved patient care and outcomes and define the next sentinel event in pediatric spinal surgery. Thank you very much for your attention.